I am excited to do this um, from the comfort of uh, my home and so you can experience it in your own homes as well. So uh, today I'm talking about container gardening, gardening specifically because that's what I'm most passionate about, but I also think it's a, a subject that most of the gardening world has been slow to catch up on. So um, yeah, I hope, I hope you uh, enjoy the presentation here. So the, basically the basic topics I'm gonna be covering today are gar the garden location, you know, where are different spots that you can put a container garden and what are some of the um, things that you might wanna consider when doing that, um, different, different locations container types. So there's two different kinds, right? like a self-watering and a traditional type, uh, as well as plastic, stone, uh, you know, clay, different types of materials. So that's what I mean by container types. Tools and accessories. You actually need a little bit fewer tools than a traditional in-ground or a raised bed garden with container gardening, but some of them are kind of specific. So I have a different, uh, a few short list for you to, to take a look at today. So I just want you to know it's very accessible to get into container gardening, even if you don't have a really big budget. Um, healthy soil for healthy plants. That is uh, basically covering what a, a good potting soil or potting mix contains, what to look for, what should it look like, and what are the bagged things that you might want to avoid at the gardening center or at uh, Lowe's or Home Depot that would not be suitable for containers. Um, and then finally, I'm going to wrap up with a pretty succinct list of vegetables and herbs that do especially well in containers, uh, most of which I've trialed myself or I've seen before, um, and then finish with uh, resources. Uh, so if you're looking to read up more about this um, and get some of the places that I learned what I'm talking to you about today, I'm going to be sharing that at the end, as well as some local resources for plants, gardening, accessories, um, and other things for our, that are specific for our area. So garden location, starting with, um, I want to put a garden in. What is the first thing I need to think about? The first thing you have to think about when putting a garden in is the sun orientation. You have to, have to, have to have some kind of sun, at least like 25% of the day in your garden spot has to have sun. Um, this is especially important for vegetables and herbs, uh, as vegetables extremely need all the sunlight that they can get. Um, that's why tomatoes really only do well in the summer because we get such a long uh, period of daylight. And that's what the plant's internal like clock is looking for is those long periods. So if you're uh, in a small space, that can be pretty challenging. Um, but just sort of go over the sizes, like if your apartment or your condo faces south, you're gonna get the strongest sunlight. Um, so you're gonna get pretty much sunlight almost all day long, especially in the morning. Um, your Western exposures, you're gonna get the second most. So we call that kind of like an afternoon sun. Um, you won't notice it as much in the morning, but when you're like coming home from work or um, there in the afternoon, as most of us are working from home these days, you get to see like those beautiful sunsets and get um, a lot of that sun pretty strongly. Eastern are third and then Northern is the least. Um, my house actually faces North. Uh, so I have a lot more shade of plants and um, like the like lettuce, and other things that are a little bit more leafy greens that do well with a little less sunlight in like those most shaded spots. So you really can grow something no matter which direction you're facing or what space that you have, um, what it allows for. So one of the big things though with sun, especially for us here in DC is a, a surrounding buildings or other things that might uh, interfere with your sunlight. So um, patios, or balcony gardens especially, usually are up against the side of a building, which means that they're gonna be, uh, you're gonna get that building shadow during certain periods of the day. So that's just something to keep in mind um, before you start a garden is just kind of to start paying attention to where the sun is in your area and um, you know, where, where are your most sunny spots and what are your least sunny spots. Um, wind is also actually a consideration, uh, especially in our area, since uh, in uh, winter we definitely have a lot more uh, wind coming through our city. But um, off the Anacostia, um, a lot of places we have that are pretty windy, and especially if you're in a balcony or, you know, pretty small yard, 
you can have issues with the wind blowing plants over, especially as if they're tall. So for example, a tomato in summer, um, not at the very beginning, it's gonna be pretty short, but towards the end, like middle of summer, like we are now, my tomatoes are easily five feet tall. So these storms that we've been getting come through, they could easily knock that over if it's not trellised or kind of staked down. Um, uh, there's a couple of good materials that you can use to kind of make a windbreak. You can use found materials. Um, you can uh, buy trellising from your local garden center or um, uh, Ace Hardware. Um, but also to keep in mind that you can, if you have a plant out there, the wind, if it's pretty excessive, it's going to dry, dry out both the soil and the plant. So you want to try to protect things that are a little bit more delicate, like vegetable plants from that wind. Um, a lot of the herbs are actually a little more um, hardy uh, when it comes to wind because a lot of them come from the Mediterranean area. And so they're expecting a lot of strong sunlight and a lot of wind. So actually rosemary or thyme, oregano, it can be a little bit more hardy for those kind of conditions. But usually you just wanna keep that in mind. Um, and your biggest location uh, consideration should be water. How quickly and easily can you get water? And not just like when you're first planting them, but in high summer, like every, every plant now needs water every day, once a day at least. Um, depending on what the plant is, it might need it twice a day in the size of your container. So it gets really old quickly if you have to be taking a, a watering can from your kitchen sink out um, through like multiple staircases or over a yard. So just something to keep in mind, if you have it outside and you're able to do a hose, that's of course gonna be your most convenient, but even just like a balcony right off of your living room can be easy as well, just something to keep in mind. So I wanted to point out a couple different locations that we have here in DC and um, the different considerations that you wanna take with them. Once again, um, so this is a couple of pictures of balcony gardens. Um, balcony gardens are going to be some of our most popular since that's some of the space that we have that's most accessible to us every single day. Um, but your sun orientation is going to be the most critical and specific on this location because the wall of the buildings, either the one you're up against or the ones uh, next to you, are going to be blocking the sun or um, blocking you know, sometimes good things, the wind. And that's something you really want to, again, pay attention to and keep in mind. Um, this big picture on the left hand side is actually of a balcony garden on a fire escape. So uh, I have looked up DC code and I don't see anything in the current DC fire escape code that says that you can't block the emergency um, escapes. But if you're in a condo association, you might or you might want to check with your landlord just in case, just to make sure that you know, you can actually put things out on the fire escape because it's not technically like a balcony. Um, so just something I wanted to put out there. Um, on the right hand side, uh, we've got a really like long and narrow space. I, I like this example because it shows that even if you don't have a really wide space, you can actually fit a lot of plants in here. Um, you could even go further and like the one on the uh, fire escape is done is just up on some simple like, like sticks of wood and cinder blocks. Uh, putting them up allows for multiple layers of plants and you can see these are just in buckets, some styrofoam containers even. So you can really maximize your storage space and keep some of your gardening tools and things out with your plants um, but still keep a lot of space available for your plants. Uh, and the one down on the bottom right, I really liked because it shows different ways that you can use any railing that you have as well. So there are multiple different like railing planters that are sold. You can find them online resources. You can find them locally. Um, usually they're built for window boxes, but you can also put individual pots there as well. So I like that this is just a really nice example of you have a very, very sunny spot, like how many things can you put on it? but still maintain like actual, like there's clearly enough space to sit out there if you want to. So balcony gardens are awesome locations for container gardens. So 
So rooftops are another space that uh, cities like ours are starting to pay attention to more and starting to make both safe and accessible. I see this a lot on the newer construction in our area that they're incorporating rooftop spaces. Um, sometimes you're gonna have to be sh obviously sharing that space with other residents. So rooftops are gonna be a little bit more specific. You wanna make sure that again, you have water access and also drainage. Uh, that's gonna be really important so that you're not damaging the roof of your building. So that's what I mean by make sure it's safe is, you know, make sure that you can walk on it, make sure that you have easy access for it, make sure that you have permission from your building, your landlord, the association, um, whomever is responsible for that maintenance, you're gonna always wanna check with them. So you don't have, you know, start a garden and then have to get told halfway through that you have to get rid of it, which is really heartbreaking. So just say right now, just check, check in. Um, and the fun thing with roofs is that you have so much light, you almost have uh, too much light. So if you have a black, um, a lot of those areas here, we have a black roof that's going to retain all of that heat throughout the day. So you might wanna consider containers that are a little bit deeper and a little bit, um, have a little bit more space for water uh, to, to collect in because that's gonna keep your plants more hydrated throughout the day. Um, if it's a white or a light colored roof, that's gonna bounce the light backwards. Um, which usually is going to be great. It's going to feel cooler to you when you're up there working on it and uh, you're going to, you know, probably not be as hot, but you can actually get sun scald if you are watering your plants and you, the, the light is really, really bright. You can actually kind of give your plants like heat stress um, and sun scald, which is kind of like a sunburn for plants, like in the way that we get sunburns, plants get sunburns too. And usually you just want to avoid that by watering in the early morning or at like towards the end of the day, just not when the sun is highest in the sky. Um, the pictures that are around the edges of this slide in particular are actually from Cultivate the City. Um, they have a location called H Street Farms, which is on top of the uh, WS Jenkson Sun off Bladensbury Road in Northeast. Um, so they actually, I'll be talking about them a little bit more later and I have them as a resource, but they have a rooftop uh, garden that is open to the public because it's actually a rooftop garden center and they do classes, they have a CSA, they're a really great organization, so uh, definitely check them out. But they have a really good variety of ways that they garden on their rooftop. Um, so I wanted to show you some pictures of their, their stacking uh, containers in the bottom left and upper right. Um, those are fantastic containers for balcony gardens or anywhere that you're tight on space and you just want to use the height to your advantage. Um, another picture is them doing kind of like the bucket bags on the top right. Again, they're cultivating for um, sale and for their CSA. So they're usually starting a lot of plants at once. This is a, a great example of another type of material um, that you can use for a container garden, especially on a rooftop. Um, another place that you can put your garden if you don't have a balcony or, or any of the, that kind of space that we've talked about so far are the front steps or the entryway or like back steps of your home. So one of the big considerations in our area is plant theft. It's pretty sad and anyone who's been working on a tomato from like February on just just to wait and grow it strong and get it big. And then, you know, you have somebody come in and pick that first tomato, knows that heartbreak. But honestly, we're in an urban area and there's sometimes only so much you can do. So um, most importantly, you wanna make sure you're not blocking your entrances or exits to your house. Make sure that you have easy access, especially in the case of an emergency. You don't, you don't want a really, really huge pot sitting right in front of your door so that you can't bring in a, a big package or your bike or something in and out. Uh, and when you have limited space like that, um, go tall with your container, like this upper left picture or upper right picture, um, tall instead of wide so that you can get, again, more variety of plants in there. I like this picture because you've got three or four different heights that you can play with and you can kind of see like, even though it's on steps, in only in one little corner, it's a lot of greenery. There's a lot of color there. So even if you only have that small of a spot, it's 
uh, a good spot as long as you have sunlight, you know, you're protected by, from wind, you've got easy access to water. Um, there's been, especially in my neighborhood, this, this picture on the bottom left, um, which says stop stealing my plants, because uh, is a neighbor of mine who's had a rosemary bush um, keep getting broken off of, and we're pretty sure it's deer, but you know, it could be somebody else either way. I, I find snarky uh, signs funny, but I understand the frustration behind it. So if you're having plant theft happen around these areas, like a lot of our row homes have like the little yards out front, but the fences are low or non-existent, and you might have one or two things walk off. Um, there's, I feel like there's always um, on pop bills, like um, plant theft was just talked about recently with like a nest camera catching somebody like pulling a plant out of the ground, which I, I can't, I, I can't figure out a way to be, you know, protect against that if you've already planted the pot, like the plant in the ground. But if you're doing it in containers, there are a couple options. Um, you can actually place like a stick at the bottom of the container over the drainage hole and then, or like a piece of uh, metal or, or um, a hanger or something like that so that you can loop a, some wire or chain around the bottom of it so you can kind of hide that a little bit where and then wrap that around a handrail or a fence or anything that you've got close to you that could kind of like just obviously it's not going to be perfect it's not going to tell you to, it's not going to be completely dismissive to someone who really really wants that plant but it might discourage someone who just thinks it's going to be like an easy thing to pick up uh, for and take down to their house. Um, I've also seen prickly shrubs around the perimeter. So spiky holly bushes and things of that nature can be a good deterrent if you're finding a lot of people are just leaning in and picking things. Um, and of course, motion lights, warning signs, snarky um, signs, passive aggressive signs that you can put on your community listserv. Um, those are always a good idea, but in reality, I don't know how well they truly work. But again, these are just things that when you're picking the garden location, you want to be aware of. Um, what I have done is put a little bit more like the more common plants or the more um, plants that like are interesting to me, but like aren't as flashy out front. Because if it's got like, you know, it doesn't have any flowers or fruit on it, you know, people are a little bit more prone to ignoring it. And then I keep things that I, I spend a long time on or like my house plants that I take out in the summer, I keep them more in like the back side of my house that's less accessible. And finally, we do have yards in DC, not uh, alike, mostly small yards. Some people have nice larger ones as well, but I wanted to concentrate on if you only have a small space, what can you do with it? And a container garden is a really great idea for a small space uh, because you get to control all the elements of it. So even again, if you have a small space, this bottom left corner, um, you can see the picket fence surrounding it and a little bit of like their front door on the right hand side. This is multiple different like raised beds, containers, stacking containers, uh, and they even have a tree in the back there. So you can still have a lot of production in a small space. Um, the bottom right hand side, that's actually my garden, um, which I've expanded over the years to go just from buckets to these like watering troughs. Um, I hang out on Craigslist a lot so I can find these watering troughs when people are selling them and, and grab them up because I just find them fantastic for gardening. Um, really one of the benefits of container gardening is getting the exact right pot for the plant as well as like making things a little bit more accessible. So instead of having to um, dig in the grounds and, and you know if you have back issues, if you have um, mobility issues, bringing a con like a container that is a little bit taller, you can bring everything up and access it a lot easier. So it makes it a lot more pleasant to be out there, especially in um, the heat that we're currently experiencing. Uh, I'm not, I'm also not weeding as much. So again, all these pictures of all these great containers, one of the best things in my uh, personal feelings about uh, are how, few, how little weeding that I do just because it's just not an issue. So variety of containers, variety of spaces to put those containers in our area. 
Um, again, just keeping in mind your sunlight and your wind uh, and your water. So I wanted to talk about, there's two kinds of container types. Uh, traditional, which is gonna have a hole at the bottom or several holes at the bottom and self-watering. And self-watering has really exploded in the gardening community in the last like several years. Um, I used to exclusively garden only in self-watering and now I have a nice variety of it. Um, you'll find a lot of DIY self-watering container uh, information online. If you, if you Google it, it seems like almost any container can be made into self-watering. But why would you want it to be self-waters? But it's, it's actually a little bit misleading because the plant isn't actually watering it. You're still watering it. But the plant is choosing when to take in the water when it needs it. So the simplicity of self-watering containers is that at the very bottom, you have a water reservoir. And then you have something that keeps that uh, water away from the soil, the plant material. And then you have something that allows you to get water into that water reservoir from the top. So a fill tube or um, a little like almost like periscope situation. So you actually, instead of watering the dirt, you put water in the fill tube. So this is just a simple example uh, illustration here. And the reason that this is so nice is that you can water it at any time of the day. You don't have to worry about sun scald or um, you know, overwatering or underwatering. Um, so you get less water on the plants. Uh, and then also when you have this water reservoir at the bottom, uh, as long as you have it full, and there's usually an overflow hole built into this as well, the, the plant wicks up this water through the mesh or through the contact with the top of the water reservoir when it needs it. So if you have a really, really hot day, it's gonna be drinking more. If we just had, again, like these storms back to back, it's not, it's already full of water, so it's not gonna wick up anymore. It re but instead of you controlling it, the plant is now regulating when it gets the water, so it's a little bit more consistent um, and plants just seem to like it more. That being said, there's some, I think, pros and cons to both sides. Um, a traditional container does dry out quicker, um, and so you'll need a more frequent watering, um, but they're easy to find at a huge variety of price points, and many, many found items can be uh, uh, made, or many found items can be uh, turned into containers for your plants. Um, you just have to have a, a creative eye for it. Um, but self-watering, uh, again, there, they're really, really great for that consistent watering, but and you get to water it less often, but either you're gonna need some DIY skills to, to, to make some, or you're gonna require, it's gonna be required to purchase those pre-made, and that can get pricey. So if you're on a budget, I usually recommend either DIYing the self-watering containers, and again, there's a lot of, so, so many options out there on how to do it, or just stick with a regular contain, like regular container, hole at the bottom, it's either made out of clay, it's made out of plastic, it's, uh, you know, whatever, so that you can just get the basics of gardening down, and then you can always swap it up later. So container types, um, there's a couple of different considerations for the materials. Um, this slide, I really wanted to show you the variety of um, materials and containers that can be upcycled into planters. And one of the reasons that you want to do this is, is really cost savings. So it's a lot more budget friendly to use what is shown up on the upper left here, which are like tidy cats. Those are actually cat litter boxes, uh, the square yellow ones. I've seen so many people guarding in those because they're pretty much the size of like a five gallon bucket you would buy at Lowe's or Home Depot or Ace Hardware and um, they just hold a lot. So one of the great reasons that you want that for obviously the cost is if you, if you start to really get up more than three or four plants, the container cost is a really big consideration when you're starting up your garden. Um, I've gardened so many different things and so many different like Rubbermaid containers just to have something to put the soil in that didn't cost me an arm and a leg. Um, the bottom left, you'll see those are recycling containers, uh, which I thought was pretty great. Uh, I know that DC doesn't have those kind anymore, so they're still kicking around. 
and I know um, they make great planter gardens. Um, five gallon buckets at the bottom there, um, pictured from Lowe's, those are fantastic. I find them especially good because if that's full of soil and it's wet, I can still lift it versus some of the big like tub trucks, like the ones that are on top being shown there. Um, those are like almost more um, an eight or a 10 gallon type container with the rope handles. You find them all over in the summer, they're at Target um, and they're mostly like in the kids section. They're really great for, they're really great for container gardening because it's easy to put holes in the bottom and they're really large, but they get really heavy really quickly. So you wanna make sure that if you're using larger containers, you keep them in one space and you don't have to move them in and out of you know, rainfall area or in and out of shade versus sun. And so container types and heaviness is certainly something that you wanna keep in mind. Um, the right-hand side here, I've got a picture that I took at one of our local Walmarts not too long ago, which just showed um, some metal containers that are actually not in the gardening section. I think the most expensive one on that page or on that picture is $12 versus if you were to get a galvanized metal tub like that from a gardening supply company, that's easily costing you $25 to $35. So again, just keep an eye out for different types of found materials that you can use. It helps you with the budget a lot. Quickly about tools and accessories. Um, you do need fewer tools, but some of them are a little bit more specific. So on the left hand side here, I kind of have like a basic like this is available on Amazon um, type of gardening tool kit that you can get. You really don't even need half of what's in that. Um, just one of those travels, pair, a good pair of gloves, um, uh, some shears, or you can use regular household scissors and then some place to store it all. Um, you really don't need that many things because what you're doing is creating your own gardening environment. And with the soil, which I'm about to talk about, um, you don't, you're not digging in the clay. And uh, around here, that's what our soil is. It's mostly um, a little layer of topsoil and then clay all the way down. And it is really difficult to dig in and it's not good, uh, as good for you know, beneficial um, nutrients as like a garden, garden soil or potting soil. Um, so one of the things I use a lot is actually a scoop, or scoops I make from either uh, the, the milk containers or like laundry detergent containers. As you can see in this picture, you just cut off the bottom of one of these things and if you keep the cap on, that, that creates like a really easy way to scoop soil from the bags which you're probably buying and in into your container. So it's one of those things that like, it just takes forever if you're using those little travels on the left there, but it's really quick to do if you're, you know, if you have like one of these things. So that's another great upcycle tool I use every single year. Um, a few other things that you might have around the house that you can upcycle into gardening stuff are chopsticks. Um, I know we get those and take out all the time. Um, they're great if you're staking up a little short plant or if you're like putting some type of cover on them for like frost or um, needing to have a little bit more sun protection, um, they'll hold those up. Planting seeds, they're really great to like use like just like make a little divot in the potting soil so you can drop the seeds in. I find them just a little bit easier sometimes as it's a more uniform. And uh, pantyhose are tights. So you can cut those like an old pair that you've got to run in uh, into really narrow strips that are stretchy and they're great for tying around anything, any plant that needs trellising. So if you have a tall house plant or you have like a tall, like especially tomato plants um, or bean plants in the summer that need more staking support, um, that is actually really, really gentle on the plant material, on the plant stem than wire would be. So um, again, just another upcycle thing you might have already around the house you can use for gardening. Um, really quickly for the soil, I just there's there's two things I want you to know about potting soil. So it's either potting mix or potting soil. Um, the good stuff is going to have a lot of like it's going to be lightweight. It's going to be easy to like have put water in, and it's going to drain the water really quickly. So um, your goal of a good potting mix, um, you want to make sure that's holding that moisture and nutrients. Um, again. 
air lightweightness, they usually use vermiculite um, or coconut coir in the mixes to keep it fluffy. That allows the roots to grow through it. That's why I mean like why clay isn't a good growing medium for a lot of plants because it gets too stuck up and the, the roots can't go through it. Um, and also it just helps support and anchor the roots. Um, a lot of what is sold you'll see is uh, called garden soil. That is a totally different product. And I just want you to be aware if you're going into buy potting soil or potting mix for the first time, you'll see this in the same section. This is really great if you have raised beds or if you're gardening in the ground. This is not a material made for containers. Containers need, like I said, a lot, a few different other things like the lightweightness, um, like the minerals. So just to keep that in mind. So my favorite potting mix recipe, because a lot of gardeners, <laughs> once you start getting into it, the soil is so much so important to the end result of the plants that you're gonna get, those herbs being more flesh and flavorful and fragrant. Um, so in our area, we have this really, really cool product called Leaf Grow, and you're gonna find it all over. Um, it's actually made in Maryland from leaves that are collected from Montgomery and Prince George's counties. It's basically compost. It's, it's called soil conditioner. I liken it to compost. Um, so it's gonna be really rich and black when you open it. Um, it's gonna smell, I think it smells really good, like really, really fresh turned earth, like after the rain. And most importantly, it's gonna have a, so many nutrients for your plants. So the easiest potting mix in the world, I think, is just to take basically a 50-50 mix of leaf grow and any potting mix that you wanna pick up at your local gardening center um, or Ace Hardware. So again, that's where the soil scoop comes into handy. Um, I usually mix up my soil in like a little short cart or bucket and then put it into a new container when I'm mixing it up. But the 50-50 split really helps get some a little additional nutrients into the soil for your plants and the potting mix helps keep it lightweight and so the water drains easily. So on the right, I have a few different um, kind of pictures of what's in our area, what you're going to see when you're going to these places to look. Um, you can use any one of these. I do not have a preference. It doesn't have to be organic. There's no shame. Um, the potting mixes that aren't organic are less expensive. And if you're on a budget, that could be what you need. Um, so you're not going to, I don't think there's a, a difference with that. Just make sure that it says either potting mix or container mix. That's what's gonna keep you away from the garden soil from the previous slide. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to give you some examples of vegetables that are especially suited to containers. These are things that I found that really, really work well in containers for one reason or another. Um, and of course, this is not the end all be all list, but this is gonna be a pretty good basics list and I am putting this, um, this is now in an email that Molly will email out to you at the end um, for, so you don't have to worry about writing down all these names, but sort of a short list, arugula, a lot of the, um, the lettuce family, you'll see lettuce on here, pak choy, radicchio, um, kale, these do amazingly well in the containers and you don't need really deep containers for anything in the lettuce family. The upper right uh, picture is a actually like a, a flower box. So if that only has like maybe six inches worth of depth, um, the roots on lettuces aren't that deep. So that's why you don't need to have a container that's super, super deep for them. And they just grow like gangbusters. Um, Swiss chard does especially well in our area. And it's really, really beautiful if you get the rainbow Swiss chard from seeds or as starter plants. Um, sometimes people don't even realize it's a vegetable. It's just this gorgeous, like lots of different colors of pinks and yellows and whites and even purples are in there. Um, some of the other ones, the bigger ones that you might not think to put in a container would actually do really well. Um, cucumber, uh, peas and pep, uh, peppers, of course, but um, really I want to talk about cucumbers and anything that's vining. Um, you just want to provide appropriate support, but after you do that, it's no problem. I have, for many years, I put like cucumbers and um, green beans up against a chain link fence because that was what was in the property. That was what was in my backyard. It was a free trellis. Like it, they'll just grow on it and I have to like work to move, move them more horizontally, but it's 
it's really, really great. So I know where I'm watering the plant because the plant's in the bucket. And I know where I'm getting and harvesting the, the plant material from because it's easily able to, I'm easily able to see it on top of a chain link fence. So you can do some of these big, more traditionally found in the, in the in-ground garden plants, as long as you have appropriate staking material, appropriate trellising. Um, on the right-hand side, this is a tomato bucket with, uh, a, so one, one tomato plant per bucket, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but um, just showing how, like even using some hardware cloth, that provides an easy trellis. You don't have to get something that's specific, like a tomato cage. You certainly can, you don't have to. Um, so again, container gardening can be really, really flexible to what your budget is, what your location is like, um, and what are the materials that you have available to you. Herbs are also awesome in containers. Um, I find uh, things like basil and mint do especially well in containers. Um, I don't know whether it's just because we can like keep them um, in a more contained area because like mint will just keep growing and growing and growing if you put it in the ground and then you know you're pulling mint out of your neighbor's backyard and maybe they didn't want that. So that's something to keep in mind. But basil is also, I love basil in the summertime. I plant it with all my tomatoes just have that natural pairing there. But a lot of the other more hardy um, herbs that can, are actually perennials, meaning that they come back year after year, also do well in containers. Um, the bottom right is actually my herb, kind of like stacked garden. And the top picture is what it looked like in May of this year. And the bottom is what it looks like right now. So I just had these two metal containers. Uh, I filled the first one with soil and then stacked the second one on top. And um, on the right hand side, I've got oregano going in there, rosemary. And on the left hand side, I've got tarragon, lemon balm, I think some echinacea and some bee balm in there too. So again, th these kind of things can like just go happily together because they need some of the same watering conditions uh, as versus like basil and mint need more water thyme, uh, oregano, rosemary, they're, those Mediterranean herbs like I talked about earlier, they need a little less. So planting, or planting in containers what makes sense together is something to keep an eye on. And finally, I think we're at time here. <laughs> I might have talked too much, but these are the resources. Again, this is going to go out in your email, but I just wanted to quickly shout out to books. Um, books have been a huge part of my gardening journey, mostly because it's a lot less overwhelming than the internet. You go online. Gardening is the most popular hobby in America, so you're going to find a million websites about um, vegetables, about plants, and that's great, but if you're really getting started, I highly, highly recommend going to your library and checking out some of these, some of these books, um, especially for container gardening. The Bountiful Container um, by Rosemary McGee and Maggie Stuckey is amazing. I refer to it almost every year. And um, the Vegetable Gardener's Container Bible, um, also really excellent. This one has a lot more pictures than this one. So I recommend if you're a visual learner going with this particular book. But those I found are the best books for container gardening specifically. Other ones that are great for our area are Vegetable Gardening in the Southeast by Ira Wallace. Um, she's amazing. I've gone to several of her um, classes and she actually worked on a seed farm. And so this is the first book I've been able to find that's really, really specific to our microclimate here in DC. Um, we have some pretty interesting microclimates. It's, our DC weather is different from like what's out in Falls Church or what's up in Frederick. It is. <laughs> Uh, we're in zone 7A uh, on the USDA um, zone, uh, zones of, of gardening. So that's a good one. And then I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Barbara Damrosh, who is the garden, the garden primer expert. She has written for the Washington Post about gardening for like three decades. And just, it's just a fantastic overall, again, book specifically for our area. Um, that's going to give you a lot more information than I can just in, in this time. Websites, um, so this is your local, the local extension for where I got my Master Gardener certification is through Prince George's County, um, but University of Maryland itself, they have a great Grow It, Eat It website. It's got a lot of resources. 
one of the things I like best is ask a garden expert. So if you just have a question, Googling it's not working or it's not in the book, you can take pictures of the plant, upload it, and a garden expert will get back to you usually pretty quickly with an answer. And I just, it's a free resource and I find it phenomenal. Um, the DC extension and I put square foot gardening on here as well. And square foot gardening is a really cool uh, system where you're planting based on how many seeds fit or how many plants fit in one square foot. Container gardening really goes well hand in hand with square foot gardening because we have such specific space. We're limited on space automatically when you're doing a container garden. You can't just let things go all over the place because you run out of soil. So I found for figuring out what plants will fit in my containers and not overcrowding them, I find the, the square foot gardening's method to be excellent. Again, he's got a book. There's, he's got a great, great website though. I really don't think you need to buy the book. You can use the website, it's fantastic. And he's also got online classes now for it too. Okay, and local gardening resources. Um, again, that's the information for Cultivate the City on H Street Farms. They have a fantastic website. It go, goes over their CSA and their classes. Rooting DC, which we talked about right at the beginning there. It's once a year in February. It's an all day gardening forum. Uh, I moved to Ron Brown Prep this last year. It is awesome. It is like the highlight of my February pretty much because uh, not when it's all cold and gross outside. You just want to get in there and talk to other plant geeks about what are the tomatoes you're growing this year? Or what are these new uh, Asian vegetables that we can grow this year? Um, and then one of the best uh, resources as well is Washington Gardener. So they do a seed exchange events um, the end of January, beginning of February every year. But um, they also put out a quarterly magazine, like a real print magazine, and they put it over, um, they put it in a digital format as well for free, so you can access it that way. They um, uh, are a fantastic resource just to keep um, abreast of like other gardening events that are happening in the area. But their seed exchange specifically is an amazing resource to get um, a lot of seeds and to establish like sort of like your seed library, your seed collection when you're first starting out for no money. It's like a very um, low entrance fee to get into this event. It's an all day event. There's a couple of classes. Um, it's just really, really fun. I try not to miss it if at all possible. Uh, and then local gardening centers where you can actually get some of these materials. Um, Ginkgo Gardens, that's a really big one on 11th Street. Old City Garden, um, they recently moved, They maybe not so recently, but moved down to Rhode Island Ave and they still have a great location. Um, Ed's Garden Center off New York Ave and I think it's used to be called Frager's Garden Center but it's called Foliage by Frager's now. That's still on Pennsylvania Avenue as well. So if you're looking for in-district resources to um, they almost everyone at the all four of these places are going to be experts in what they do. So again, if you have questions when you're looking at plants, don't be afraid to ask um, the folks that work here. Everyone's been really, really nice and they're a great resource. Um, and then finally, if you don't want to go in person um, and it's COVID time, so you might just want to get some plants or seeds by mail. These are my favorite resources. Um, the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange is actually the farm that Ira Wallace, author of this book, The Vegetable Gardening of the Southeast, works at. Um, I find because they are not far from DC, they, their seeds are like the best suited for our specific microclimate. So I love them. I love their, the quality of their seeds is always fantastic. If you like looking at all kinds of weird and rare and interesting seeds and things like that, I highly recommend rareseeds.com. Um, they're called Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds and they just like pick one weird thing a year to grow and just like have fun with it because gardening should be fun at the end of the day. It should be something that you're enjoying and that is fun. So I find it fun when you're growing something that's really strange. Um, if you like berries, uh, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, and then a whole lot more, Norse Farms is phenomenal for that. Uh, and then if you're looking in the perennials, which um, I don't really talk about too much in container gardening, but um, you can certainly do. Bluestone Perennials has been really good to me. They do really, really healthy um, plants by mail. And they have this pretty cool thing. If you don't know where to start at all, they have a pre-planned garden plan. So you can like literally purchase 
here's the plan and here's all the plants together and then plant them according to the plan and you've got a, a pollinator garden, for example. So they are pretty neat. Um, they're, uh, yeah, I think it's a unique concept. So yeah, that's Container Gardening 101. And I think we have time for questions, Smalling, is that all right? We do, yeah. Uh, we have, we got a lot of questions in chat, so I hope you're ready. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'll try. I'll start to try. All right. Um, yeah, so again, just for everybody that just joined us, uh, some of you came in late, uh, but if you hover over your screen uh, at the bottom, you should see a little pop-up that says chat, and when you click that, if you have any gardening questions, you can type them in chat. Uh, I'm going to scroll back and look at some questions we were asked early on. Uh, Sonia asked, what do you use as water reservoirs? Oh, cool. So I use um, colanders. I use a colander from the dollar store or the dollar section of Target upside down in a five gallon bucket. Um, and that is the easiest like water reservoir period because the colander has like a finer mesh or holes or slats or whatever um they that allows the soil to be in contact with it um but without all the soil falling through so colanders are like my perfect um i've also seen people do it with like tupperware um but pretty much think of a colander if it looks like that you could probably use it as a water reservoir uh, Jennifer asked, what types of plants do best in stacking containers versus doing better in their own container? Oh, good question. Um, let me go back to this. So stacking containers, um, a lot of the lettuces and um, uh, greens will do better in a stacking container because they're only going to get to a certain height. Um, like even Swiss chard, which is a little bit tall, that works really well. You don't want to put things like peas um, or summer squash or tomatoes in a stacking container because those plants are going to grow a lot longer and a lot taller. Um, strawberries are a really, really um, traditional stacking container um, option because then the fruit hangs out and you can see it to pick it really nicely and it looks really pretty. But again, strawberries don't get that tall either. So um, you just want to be thinking about like, what's the finished size of that? Like what is, how big is it going to be when it's done? Which we should know from like the grocery store, but um, think about that end result height on that and, and you'll be fine. Carmen asked, some of my plants and containers are being eaten by a small bug or insect. What can I do to avoid this without using poisonous products? Awesome. Okay, so that's a really complicated question because I don't know what plant and I don't know what bug. So okay. I recommend what's wrong with my vegetable garden. This is a <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. told you I like books. Uh, it's a great title. A yeah. It's really great. Um, so I find that some it's really hard to diagnose when you're first starting out what is eating this or that. Um, so the this book goes through like her like per plants, like radishes, all the problems that a radish can get. Uh, and it has a lot of pictures. So um, either finding that or an online resource. Um, there's one also about organic gardening. I don't think I have next to me, um, but that one's also on my bookshelf, which is pest control for organic gardening. Google something around there and you'll be able to find it. The easiest solution if something is biting it already is to try to cover it with um, basically row cutter, floating row cover or plant cover. It looks like, uh, it's like a white kind of tissue paper looking kind of substance and it's like comes folded up in like a plastic bag and you can find it at the garden centers on Amazon. And if it's something that's coming in and flying and eating that, you can cover the whole container and plant with that and that would keep it out. But if it's already in it, um, like a squash line board eats from the inside out on a squash plant, then, then you've just trapped the bug inside with the plant. So unfortunately, like without more detail, like I don't know, and I have to look it up every time, but there's definitely good resources out there for that. Um, oh, the, the next question is a good one uh, from Gloria. I have a problem with squirrels eating my tomatoes and digging in the pots. Any suggestions on how to deter them? Oh, it's the bane of my existence, squirrel. Right? <laughs> yeah. They're eating all my, my tomatoes right now, too. And 
the one of the best things I've found is called a um, motion activated sprinkler. There's one that's called, I think it's the Crow or something, something like that. Um, there's a couple of the brands out now. If you have the space for it, this is the funniest, most entertaining way to keep squirrels away because it's literally exactly what it says. It's a motion activated sprinkler. So as soon as, like once you train it on your garden, if the squirrel or deer come up, come up by, you know, it, it's a really kind of loud sprinkler system, it'll soak them. That I have found is to be very helpful to trying to, try to guard like a larger area. For a smaller plant, um, or if they're like digging in it, and that's the issue versus eating the tomatoes, which they're always gonna eat the tomatoes. Um, so squirrels don't like anything that's spicy. So that's one of the ways that you get them to stop eating bird seed out of your bird feeder is to like mix in like hot pepper. Um, I've gotten a Costco and gotten like the Cajun, like whatever the hottest pepper is at the Costco sire <laughs> size container and mixed it into the top like three inches of soil. So that way if the squirrel's digging in it, it gets like all the spiciness up in their nose and hopefully they'll leave it alone. Um, I found some success with that. Um, I've also found that um, Sadly, you just have to either accept that you're gonna lose some tomatoes and pick them early, like pick them when they're yellow so that they'll ripen on the inside of your house and you won't lose them to squirrels. Recently, I've heard that squirrels do that because they're thirsty and that if you leave a container of water out that they might go for that instead of the tomatoes. I don't think that's completely true. I wish it was true, but you could try it and see what happens. Uh, another person asked, I've seen grit added to soil on some gardening shows. What is it and where can we find it? Is it, is it grit, like G-R-I-T? Yeah, it's like, it's like true grit, G-R-I-T. <laughs> yeah, it's like. Um, I'm not really sure what you're talking about either. Um, okay. Maybe we'll so, get more, more information in another comment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, like if you're talking about like, like I've seen you, for drainage, sometimes people like to put a little bit of gravel at the bottom of containers to keep the um, soil from just falling out, especially if your drainage hole is large. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I mean, the only thing I, I would think off the top of my head is that if you have more things like cacti or succulents that need a more sandy or gritty soil, they don't need as much of the or organic matter. Um, that could be it, but I'm so sorry. I don't know what you're talking about with like a regular potting soil. Okay. Jennifer asked, when is a good time of year to start a container garden? Does it need to be early in the year or could you start this late in the summer? So you can start this late. Uh, absolutely. So you can plan for a fall garden now. This is when um, we're starting to plant anything that would be coming from seed um, is certainly being started now in July or August. Um, that would be things like winter squash, uh, pumpkins, acorn squash, any of those guys will work. Um, also, spinach does a lot better in the, um, in the shorter days uh, at the cooler end of the season than the cooler spring, um, which has kind of been a new revelation for me in the last couple of years. So all of your, um, your greens, all of your arugula and Swiss chard and lettuces can be planted now. And they'll, as they start maturing, it's gonna get cooler and cooler for them. So you'll actually be able to harvest them in the fall pretty easily. So I would say if you can't start one in spring, right now is actually a really great time. And then you get a little bit of something, you know, then you get your container set up, you get something coming in before winter hits, uh, and then you can start fresh in the spring, you'll have everything ready. And I usually start in like March or April um, by starting seeds inside. Awesome. Uh, we have one more question from Anne. Uh, Anne wrote, I heard only one tomato in a container. Why is this? Yes, so one tomato plant per five gallon bucket. If you had something that was like longer than a five gallon bucket, but in your head, like think about how much soil is in a five gallon bucket. The reason is, is that a fully producing tomato plant needs that entire space for their root system. I have done it with more than one tomato plant in a five gallon bucket or a bucket of similar size. They don't grow as tall and they are not as productive. So specifically with, um, this is also true for peppers, by the way. 
um, peppers and tomato plants, one per bucket will give them the space that they need for the roots. Because again, if you think about it, there's only so many nutrients in the soil. Like you can, you can fertilize a little bit, but really the, the idea of a container garden is to try to keep it as easy and as um, you know, um, approachable as possible. So I try to mix in all my nutrients and everything into the soil directly versus relying on having to fertilize like every month or something. Um, so there's only so many um, nutrients and microorganisms and everything that they can get out of the soil. So if you put more than one plant in it, then you have twice the um, twice the, the plants that are competing for those, those resources, those nutrients. So you can, you don't just don't get tomato plants quite as big and I don't recommend it anymore. All right, uh, Gloria wrote that uh, they were getting the sprinkler ASAP for the squirrels. So thank you, Kristen, for that. <laughs> it's on Amazon Prime. It is awesome. <laughs> it is so great. Right. Well, thank you. Oh, sorry, did mean to cut you off. <laughs> no, no, no. It just it just it works with deer and neighborhood cats too. Uh, so if you have cats that are like maybe scratching up your. <laughs> You're scratching up and peeing in your containers, it works with cats too. Yeah, I just discovered that the reason my squash plants have been destroyed is because apparently there is a deer in the neighborhood that really likes squash. I saw it eating the squash plants. I know, I know. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's so frustrating. It happened. Uh, but thank you so much for giving us this talk, Kristen. Uh, this was awesome. Thank you to everybody who came. This was our first ever digital maker talk. And I think you guys have made it an enormous success. Uh, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, if you signed up for this class via email, which I think pretty much everybody here did, uh, we will be following up with another email where we send a copy of this presentation and uh, Kristen's uh, resources along via the email. So uh, if some of you had uh, technical problems and weren't able to see the pictures, uh, those will be coming to you as well and so you'll be able to look all that up. Um, we're going to have some more maker talks. They're going to be every month and they're all going to be digital for the foreseeable future. Uh, the best way to find out about the next one is to go to the Facebook page for DC Public Library. Uh, that's facebook.com slash DC Library and we'll have it there in the form of an event. Um, and then uh, we'll also be, uh, we also have a page on our website called dclibrary.org slash library at home. And that has all of our digital programming uh, in, in the time of COVID, essentially. So there'll be even more stuff going on there as well that you can attend. But yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Thank you all. And uh, thank you again, Kristen, for giving us such a great talk. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I hope everyone has a great rest of their weekend. All right. Have a great weekend, everybody.